Hi, this is Katie Jones, the facilitator of today's webinar presented by the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center. We're going to get started here in just a minute. We've got uh, a couple more people trickling in, uh, so just bear with us for a minute, and I'll be right back. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started with today's webinar. Hello, and welcome to today's Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center Livable Communities webinar series. Today's webinar is entitled Pedestrian Safety from Around the World with Charlie Zagier, Director of the PBIC. My name is Katie Jones and I'm the PBIC Marketing Manager and I'll be facil facilitating today's webinar. I'd first like to say hello to today's speaker to make sure he's ready and everyone can hear him. Charlie, are you there? I'm here. Great. Now, attendees, if you can hear me and if you can hear Charlie, Click the hand in the box in the upper right-hand corner of your screen to raise your hand, just so that we can be sure that our audience can hear us. All right, great. I'm seeing hands raised. Um, I do want to note um, that if you're having audio issues, um, sometimes we find it's better to dial into the phone line as opposed to using the uh, voice over the Internet, uh, the mic and speakers option. So if you are having some audio technical difficulties, try dialing in the phone line. Uh, you might have a little bit more success that way. Now, uh, before we get started, I want to go over a few administrative details and the functionality of the webinar software. If for some reason your computer or your web browser freezes during the webinar, please reload the website and just log back into the program. You'll be able to rejoin the session at any time. Please note that attendees will not be able to speak during the webinar. Uh, we do expect a large number of attendees on this call, so by muting your audio, it helps us to cut down on confusion and background noise. As an attendee, you have a control box in your upper right of your screen that collapses and expands by clicking those double arrows. Though you won't be able to speak, you will have the ability to ask questions by entering them into the question box. If you have a problem during the webinar, you may enter it here, and I'll monitor these questions and respond to you um, as I'm able. Questions pertaining to the presentation itself may be asked at any time in the question box, uh, but we will not be addressing those questions until the end of the program. Charlie's going to speak for about 50, maybe 55 minutes. It's going to be about an hour-long presentation. And then we've built in some time at the end there for questions. Please feel free to ask those questions as we go along, but once again, we'll go over them after the presentation. And also, when you exit the webinar, there is a very brief survey that will pop up. Uh, we would very much appreciate your feedback on our performance, so we would appreciate at the end of the webinar if you could take a couple of minutes to fill that out. And before we get started with the program today, I wanted to give everyone a little information about what this webinar series is about. The goal of the Livable Communities webinar series is to better enable our audience to improve the quality of life in their communities by promoting safe walking and bicycling as a viable means of transportation and physical activity. The bi-monthly series was developed by the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center, or the PBIC, a national clearinghouse of pedestrian and bicycle-related safety information and resources. We offer information and technical assistance to diverse audiences about health and safety, engineering, advocacy, education, enforcement, access, and mobility as it relates to pedestrians and bicyclists. The PBIC and today's webinar are both made possible with funding from the U.S. Department of Transportation Federal Highway Administration. Today's session will be archived and available for download on our website at www.walkinginfo.org forward slash webinars. Uh, we usually try to get the archived video of it up within about a week. We also transcribe all of our webinars. Um, those take a little bit more time to get up, hopefully within uh, two to three weeks following the date of the webinar. And in addition to these webinars, PBIC offers four different in-person training courses to provide technical assistance to professionals and community members in developing pedestrian safety action plans and improving conditions for walking. These courses, you can find more information on our website at walkinginfo.org forward slash training. So now I'm going to turn our screen over to Charlie Segear for our feature presentation. Um, before I do that, we'd like to ask uh, a polling question uh, to our audience. Uh, we'd just like to gauge how many participants uh, are at your individual site. So if you could kind of take a moment to answer that question, and I'm going to pass the controls over to Charlie. Okay, thank you, Katie. And while everybody is answering that question, hopefully you should uh, be able to see my screen about now. Well, once I close the poll out, they will. Be. Okay. Um, right. 
And so as, uh, as people are answering that question, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our speaker, Charlie Zagir. He is the director of our PBIC and also the associate director of engineering and planning at the UNC Highway Safety Research Center, which is where the PBIC is located. He has taught courses on pedestrian and roadway safety throughout the United States over the past 25 years. He has been principal investigator and primary report author on numerous federal studies and guides, including the Federal Highway Guide, How to Develop a Pedestrian Safety Action Plan, and the NCHRP Report, A Guide for Reducing Collisions Involving Pedestrians, both of which can be found in our PBIC online library. Um, I'd like to welcome Charlie, and uh, thank you for your presentation today. And again, we'll take questions at the end. Um, and once I close our poll here, thank you, everybody. Um, about 72% of you are, are sitting in your office alone, so hopefully you're, uh, uh, you're not too lonely. But uh, we've got some, some groups of six or more as well, so thank you. Now, Charlie, um, have you accepted the, uh, the ability to show your screen? Uh, just a second. Okay. I forgot to do that. Let me go back. Oh, here it is. So, all right, did that do it? Yeah. So we can see okay. your screen. Go ahead and start the presentation. All right, good. All right, thanks, Charlie. Okay. All right, Katie, can, uh, can you see that okay? Yep, looks good yep. to me. Okay. Folks, what I'd like to do today is um, give a similar presentation um, to what I gave back at the end of May, uh, actually at a conference in Jerusalem. And it was a conference of the International Conference on Safety and Mobility of Vulnerable Road Users. So basically focused on pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorcyclists. And uh, it was held uh, May uh, 30th through June 2nd. And uh, <clears throat> this was really intended primarily to look at some of the problems that pedestrians face in terms of motor vehicle safety and, and pedestrian crashes around the world. But the first part of this, I decided to really look uh, a little bit at uh, pedestrians, uh, bicyclists, and motorcyclists sort of as a group. So uh, essentially what I made use of was a report uh, by the World Health Organization uh, published in 2009 called Global Status Report on Road Safety, Time for Action. And uh, so this report really has a tremendous amount of information from uh, pretty much every country in the world. And basically they tried to get statistics as best they could, primarily on uh, motor vehicle fatalities. And what this study found is that worldwide, every year, I think they use 2008 data, there are about 1.2 million deaths on, on our highways worldwide. And in addition, about 20 to 50 million non-fatal injuries. And uh, they also found that um, motor vehicle roadway crash fatalities are uh, uh, comparable to deaths from all communicable diseases, you know, from you know, the, the bird flu and, and AIDS and all these other diseases that uh, motor vehicles kill about as many people in the world as all those uh, illnesses. Also, the study found that um, Motor vehicle uh, collisions is the, are the leading cause of death in the world to people ages 15 to 29. And the third leading cause of death to people ages 5 to 44. And of those 1.2 million deaths, about half involve you know, pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorcyclists, sort of the group of vulnerable road users. Okay, now speaking of children, uh, the study also found that about 21% of all the road traffic deaths involve children. So if you take 21% of about 1.2 million, you're talking about around 250,000 children die on our highways every year in the world. And so if you break that down by day, about 200 and, uh, 720 children die on the roads every day in the world. Uh, so we really have a, a problem. And um, uh, road traffic crashes are also the leading cause of a disability among children. Many of these are uh, permanent disabilities. If we look at these statistics broken down by uh, low income, middle income, and high income countries, uh, th there's kind of a lot to digest here. But if you kind of look at the, uh, the bars uh, from left to right, 
Uh, first, in low-income countries, the, the bar on the left is pedestrian fatalities. So you can see low-income countries have more overall uh, fatalities for pedestrians than do middle-income or high-income countries. If you look sort of left to right, you see bicyclists are sort of higher in the low- and middle-income countries, very low in the uh, uh, motorized countries, uh, partly because not that many people ride bicyclists in the uh, higher-income countries compared to other countries. Um, the motorized four-wheelers, uh, you know, passenger cars, and I assume trucks and buses, um, also are, are higher in the middle-income countries and lower-income, and so you can sort of see how these breakdowns uh, compare. This uh, slide, you can see sort of a, uh, on a percentage basis, the blue there in the pie chart shows that more than half of roughly 400,000 pedestrian deaths every year worldwide, more than half of those happen in the low-income countries, uh, about 56 percent, compared to about 39 percent of the deaths in the middle-income countries and, and about 5 percent in the high-income. So you can see how those are distributed uh, by those uh, breakdowns. Here's another way of looking at it. If you look at uh, deaths on the highway as a percentage uh, of total deaths, broken down by pedestrians, bikes, motorcyclists, and, and uh, motorized cars and trucks, et cetera. You can see for the high-income countries, about 60% of the motor vehicle deaths are to the you know, motorists, essentially, uh, versus about 40% in middle-income countries and 34%. So you can also see, for example, in the low-income countries, uh, about 45% of the deaths there are to pedestrians. Okay, and this sort of breaks it down, this next slide, uh, in terms of pedestrian fatalities by region of the world. It shows, for example, that the Western Pacific nations uh, have about 22 percent of their deaths are to pedestrians. Uh, in Europe, it's about the same, about 21 percent. Um, and um, the Southeast Asia, 15 percent, the Americas, 22 percent, Africa, 12 percent, and Eastern Mediterranean, about 8 percent. Okay, now the, the next thing we looked at from this uh, uh, World Health Organization report was, okay, but country by country, you know, which countries have the most pedestrians killed? And if you look at this uh, graph, you can see China, China has the most with about 23,000 pedestrian deaths. Uh, next on the list uh, was India with about uh, 14,000 every year. The Russian Federation has about uh, 12,000. Brazil, about 10,000, uh, Iran, about uh, six to 7,000, South Africa, about 6,000. So you can kind of see, and obviously, you know, China and India with each over a billion people, you know, that's, that's part of what's going on. But also, they, they have uh, a large percent of their trips on foot and by bicycle, et cetera. But these are number of pedestrian deaths by country. And you can see the United States with its uh, four to 5,000 deaths per year. <coughs> Okay, the next thing we looked at was what about country by country? What, what countries have the highest percent of their traffic deaths that involve pedestrians? So in Peru, of all the, the motor vehicle deaths they have every year, about 78% of them involve pedestrians being killed. You know, more than three-fourths of all their traffic fatalities involve pedestrians. Okay, next on the list is uh, Mozambique. 68%, El Salvador, Congo, Ukraine, Ethiopia, etc. So you can see a number of countries that have more than half of their traffic fatalities involve pedestrians. Something else that came out of that same report was sort of a um, estimation of what are some of the factors that are most uh, associated with motor vehicle deaths in general. And uh, some of the ones that they uh, mention are speed, you know, high-speed motorists, drinking and driving, uh, use or, I guess, lack of use of motorcyclist helmets, uh, seatbelt use or lack thereof, I, I assume, and uh, the issue of the use of child restraints, which is pretty much uh, uh, done uh, in the U.S., but not so much in some of the uh, other, especially low-income countries. Okay, the next series of slides uh, is meant to be a little bit uh, 
I guess, lighthearted. <laughs> uh, it's intended to show, uh, as many of us know, that not all motor vehicle crashes, and certainly not all crashes to uh, pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorcyclists, can be easily solved by fixing the roadway itself. So here's just a few examples of, uh, and I'm not sure who the photographer of this next series of slides is, but, but I think it was really well done, and I commend them for kind of showing what we uh, often see, or sometimes see, out there on our streets. Okay, this is uh, not an example of a very good pedestrian bridge. Um, and I'm not sure bicyclists were ever intended to carry refrigerators uh, or pigs. And this uh, person um, has used a bicycle maybe uh, as a truck would be intended for use, or to carry many family members on a moped. Uh, and I have no idea what this is, so someone will have to explain this to me. Well, this gentleman wants to take back his um, bottles, I guess, for a refund uh, or for carrying furniture on a moped or chickens, roosters. Can you imagine uh, what would be the outcome of a collision with this vehicle? Uh, or, I guess, a second vehicle you could, you could carry on your bicycle or more pigs or going to the market with your eggs, uh, more chickens. I'm not sure if this is uh, actually the first case of training wheels for a motorcycle or not, but uh, you don't see that very often. And I consider this to be the largest rear view mirror in, in, that I've ever seen. Uh, I guess you can carry your fish home on your motorcycle. And I consider this to be maybe one of the first air conditioned uh, motorcycles. Or you can carry your pipes, more pipes, or your yard furniture, your fish from the grocery store, your containers, uh, flowers, and your produce, hula hoops, uh, your whole family. And this is not a very good uh, bicycle bridge. So anyway, enough of that. <laughs> uh, basically, the, the point is, you know, that we can't solve all of our uh, uh, crashes involving pedestrians or bicyclists or motorcyclists with roadway and engineering treatments alone. But, but what we're going to do is to try to at least focus in on some of the things that we can learn uh, from around the world and maybe some of the applications that uh, we can implement in our own communities. So we start out, and in fact, I'm going to kind of run through basically what I was trying to um, convey at the conference was that here in the U.S., we're really trying to do a better job of providing for the, the needs of uh, pedestrians as well as other road users and really balance those needs. And before I go on, one of the things that it, uh, I was aware of early on in preparing the presentation is that to really do justice to this presentation on pedestrian safety around the world, you know, someone should go to every country, every continent, and really uh, explore in depth, you know, what are the conditions, what are the factors, what are the roadways like, and really to get a good understanding of all the different issues. And certainly that was not possible. Um, and, and in my estimation, it would take many lifetimes for somebody to, to accomplish that. So uh, what I ended up doing was relying on a few uh, other folks I know, uh, Michael King, Tom Bertulis, John LaPlante, Ryan Snyder, uh, Sean Turner, and then a really good website on international photographs uh, from the gentleman uh, uh, Carl Felstrom, uh, and uh, really tried to pull in some of the photographs from different countries that, that I have not been to, trying to, to uh, reach more of a sort of a balance of more places uh, from around the world and what they do for pedestrians. Now, while we were in Jerusalem and I was doing some sightseeing before the conference, uh, I would see signs like this. This one says, danger of death. Uh, and obviously, the uh, message here is don't climb this tower because there are live wires and you may die. And so while we know that there are dangers all around us from electrocution, from poison, from, from, from many things, um, we, we don't really always understand the risks that we take as pedestrians uh, you know, when we cross streets. And I'm not suggesting that we put signs up saying, 
be careful not to be killed when you cross the street because we don't want to scare our pedestrians. We want to have lots of people walking for health and transportation and for, for many reasons. It's really uh, got so many benefits. Uh, so we don't want it to scare people, but there are risks for walking and we want to see how we can reduce those risks uh, through certainly uh, better engineering, uh, education enforcement, uh, policy changes, and, and other actions that we have some control over. And oftentimes, you know, when there's uh, just the, the wrong combination of uh, vehicle speed or uh, roadway design features or lack of uh, proper behavior by the motorist or pedestrian uh, or, or, or some combination of factors, uh, nighttime conditions, that it can lead to uh, serious injury or death to pedestrians. So now we're going to look at some of the factors involved. Uh, and one of them certainly, and I start out by using some examples of things uh, that we find in the United States that may uh, contribute to uh, pedestrian crash risk. And this is one example we showed uh, from one of our western cities that was built with many, many lanes where we know that the motorists are moving uh, very high rates of speed. And pedestrians have many lanes to cross. And so even though there are not many motor vehicles there now, um, during rush hour, you can imagine what this would look like and how difficult it would be for a pedestrian to get across the street safely. And long distances uh, between signalized intersections. Other typical examples that we see in many U.S. cities are multi-lane roads where pedestrians uh, often try to cross and maybe have to wait in the middle of the street until traffic clears, until there's a gap in traffic because Often motorists don't uh, tend to yield to pedestrians, even though they, they should yield by law at uh, legal crossings. Or we see many of our streets and roads that were built uh, in the U.S., especially in the last uh, 30 years or so, uh, that were built really without much consideration for the needs of pedestrians. So this is uh, what may result. You may have pedestrians walking in the street. Or imagine walking in the street at night with dark clothes on, uh, with high-speed traffic. And, some of the risks that can result. Uh, some of the nighttime uh, areas in cities, uh, you know, pedestrians are at risk even if there's a marked crosswalk uh, or even if there's a traffic signal with uh, walk, don't walk signals. Um, pedestrians are sometimes nearly invisible to motorists and uh, motorists uh, may not be uh, very alert. They may be uh, distracted and there are many causes that, that may lead to pedestrian collisions at night. We know alcohol has been certainly a, a big problem for uh, drivers for, for many decades in this country. We also know that uh, some many pedestrians that are, that are killed uh, have been drinking uh, extensively uh, and have a high BAC level uh, as well. So, so there are those kinds of issues that, that we deal with. We know in recent years cell phone use and other distractions to drivers and pedestrians and moped users can play a role in collisions. And even when we do try to build nice facilities like this uh, Mark Crosswalk, uh, we don't always take care of the details, uh, like the bush that's blocking the crosswalk at the other end. Uh, we know in the U.S. a uh, big percentage of our pedestrian crashes happen at signalized intersections involving left turn and right turn motorists that may not yield to pedestrians when, when turning. And sometimes we, we may build a sidewalk, but then for, for some unknown reason, we stop the sidewalk in the middle of nowhere and put up a sign that says sidewalk uh, closed. <clears throat> so the question is, you know, are we really trying to properly plan for the needs of pedestrians uh, to get where they want to go and to be able to be out there walking uh, in our roadway environment? Or when we do build sidewalks, we close them for some unknown reason uh, and really don't provide a safe alternative for them to walk on that side of the street. Now here's a few shots I took uh, while I was in Jerusalem. Uh, again, it's not just the U.S. that has these problems. You can find these kinds of problems, uh, I would guess, in almost any city in the world. Here's an example where the sidewalk just abruptly ends and actually <laughs> pedestrians' path are blocked by parked uh, vehicles. Or there's a nice wide sidewalk that's being built, but there's really uh, little attempt to, to make it clear and safe for pedestrians uh, I'm maneuvering through. Even in Barcelona, uh, which I'm going to talk a lot more about in a minute, with all of the 
great amenities for pedestrians and bicyclists there, uh, you have uh, uh, motorists that are discourteous and, and block sidewalks and, and other sidewalk furniture <clears throat> that uh, blocks the path of pedestrians. Uh, this actually, I think, was in London. I think that's mislabeled, but uh, even there, uh, sometimes pedestrians don't have very much room to negotiate, even where there are sidewalks. Here's an example of a, a driver that just decided to park on the sidewalk. And oftentimes, the way our facilities are built, designed, or planned, or built, or maintained, um, don't lend themselves to safe pedestrian travel. So oftentimes, pedestrians are kind of forced to do the best they can. Uh, this child just decided to make a run for it just to try to get across the street safely. And now I'm going to show a few examples of some uh, facilities uh, around the world. Uh, the first grouping of them are uh, some of the problems that, that are out there. Uh, I'm told that this particular road in Dubai, um, in the UAE, carries motors at speeds of up to 200 kilometers per hour and that it's fairly common for pedestrians to get hit and killed uh, along this, this street. Here's an uh, arterial street in Mexico City. And you can see that uh, it's a multi-lane road. It does have a, a median, but you know, pedestrians are sort of crossing um, uh, in a mid-block and uh, may not uh, be able to uh, avoid oncoming traffic. Here's a, a street in Africa, very heavily traveled in one direction, uh, with pedestrians trying to uh, negotiate through the, the uh, stopped traffic. Here's an example of Mexico City uh, in the downtown area with uh, very heavy motor vehicles uh, during, it looks like, the morning rush hour. Indonesia, that, that deals with a wide distribution of uh, mode split, mode share between uh, pedestrians, bicyclists, uh, motor, motorcyclists, buses, and that there's no real clearly defined space uh, for all these different uh, users, and that there are collisions, uh, obviously, that, that you could foresee here. And in many countries uh, that do try to provide uh, for lots of motor vehicle movement, uh, left turn movements and, and uh, separate right turn lanes and such, uh, this really needs to be done uh, with pedestrian needs in mind. So even though it looks like that there are raised islands and crosswalks, uh, this intersection could certainly be designed better to accommodate shorter pedestrian crossings. Here's an example in India with just a lot of space at the intersection and uh, with different road users trying to maneuver and negotiate through there. And you can see some of the uh, risks that, that might occur. Or this particular street in an urban area in India, where pedestrians are literally walking you know, in uh, the travel lane with their backs to traffic. There's no clear sidewalks uh, along this route. Or here's uh, another discourteous driver that just opens the door and blocks uh, pedestrians' path, so pedestrians are having to walk out into the street. Even in Copenhagen, Denmark, here's a, a motorist decided to park on the sidewalk with the door open, so uh, you know, th these things happen almost any city. Indonesia, uh, pedestrians crossing not only in the Mark Crosswalk, but pretty much anywhere along this uh, uh, corridor. <clears throat> and in London, even with really uh, heavy channelization where they try to channel pedestrians to cr cross to certain areas, you can see pedestrians, uh, this pedestrian in particular, decided just to, to cross where he, where he wanted to cross. So we can't always control pedestrian movement. Here's a street in Indonesia where, I guess, if you want to get across the street, you have to cross over and come up on the little wall and balance yourself until it's clear. Or this street in Beijing, China, where even though they do have a, uh, a raised uh, uh, orange uh, barrier, it seems like that there's no motorists that are stopping to yield to that pedestrian in the, uh, trying to cross in the crosswalk. So we really do depend on behavior by motorists uh, as well as road design and certainly pedestrian behavior to have a safe environment. Or this crossing in Seoul, uh, South Korea, where we have kind of a situation with uh, rocks where pedestrians are supposed to balance themselves 
uh, going, and I'll show you a little uh, more overview of this, for pedestrians trying to cross from one path to another. You can see, see where there may be some issues with this for maybe especially young children or seniors or people in wheelchairs. I don't think this would pass our US ADA guidelines. Now, certainly we want to create a safe environment for all uh, pedestrians with all abilities, uh, ages, characteristics, and so certainly uh, uh, having a nice network of uh, well-designed, well-planned sidewalks and walkways is the first step in doing that. And then getting pedestrians safely across the street is, is the next uh, goal that we really need to pay attention to, and certainly most uh, pedestrian crashes happen in, when crossing the street, obviously. The principle one here says pedestrians want and need to cross the street safely. And uh, as you can see here, these pedestrians look terrified, <laughs> and maybe they have good reason to be. Uh, but pedestrians shouldn't be terrified to cross the street. And so we should really design streets and enforce motorist behavior so that that's not the case. Second principle is pedestrians will cross where it's most convenient for them. We can't always expect pedestrians to cross long distances to, to go to a traffic signal. And even if they do, crossing at a signal isn't always a guarantee of safe crossing either. But there are issues with turning vehicles, with uh, vehicles running red lights, with vehicles turning right on red or right on green. So there are certainly issues at signals as well. We just need to keep some of these principles in mind. Uh, we know that it's also important for drivers and pedestrians to understand each other's intent. If a pedestrian is expecting a motorist to yield in a marked crosswalk, and a motorist is, is expecting a pedestrian to wait for them, then you can see where, where a collision could occur. We know about speed and how it affects crash risk. Uh, we know here this is a plot of the stopping distance uh, at different speeds. It includes a combination of how the distance that for, uh, it takes a motorist to react from the time they see a pedestrian ahead until the time they get their foot on the brake. And that's reaction time and distance. So even if you assume uh, a second and a half or so, and then you add to it the braking distance, you can see how this uh, stopping distance dramatically increases at higher speeds. So one of our goals should be to, to design our streets or enforce the uh, laws to keep vehicle speeds at a reasonable level. And then if there is a collision, uh, we know that speed kills. We know speed matters. And uh, based on some of the research from Europe, uh, it showed that if a pedestrian is hit by a motorist going 40 miles an hour, then there's about an 80%, 85% chance that that pedestrian will die. If we can get the speeds down 10 miles an hour, down to 30 miles an hour on that street, and a vehicle hits a pedestrian, well, at least the pedestrian has a 50-50 has a chance, about 45% chance of death. If we can get the speed down further to 20, the chance of a pedestrian dying is down to 15%. So, so really, th these are goals that we strive for. And we also know that good street design uh, that makes use of these principles um, you know, really helps reduce pedestrian crash risk. So pedestrians shouldn't have to run across the street. They shouldn't have to run for their lives. And so what can we do to, to help counter that? And what are other countries doing around the world uh, as well as in the US? So in summary, some of the principles are you know, keep it simple, shorten crossing distances, uh, certainly make the crossings more visible, uh, and provide proper traffic control, and do whatever we can with street design, in particular to slow down vehicle speeds. We also know that uh, uh, enforcement is important, education is important, that all these ingredients have to be used in combination in order to create a reasonably safe pedestrian environment. The other option, which we don't recommend, is what this gentleman said. He says, I never know where I'm going to cross the street, so I keep this sign with me. So we, we don't want to, to have our pedestrians having to carry around signs like this. All right, let's just jump around the world a little bit uh, and look at a few cities and, and some of the things they're doing for pedestrians. Uh, Barcelona, Spain is, was one of my favorite cities uh, of all time that I visited, and uh, just a beautiful city. The architecture is, is amazing. Uh, the art is, is well known. Um, the uh, pedestrian malls are, are uh, very well designed and carry huge numbers of pedestrians, and people really enjoy walking in the downtown areas in these malls. You can also see well-planned, well-designed walkways and paths for pedestrians and bicyclists. And uh, here's an example of one of the asphalt paths, very pleasant with street trees and proper width. At some of the crossings, they, they have special signals. They call this the toucan crossing. Pedestrians and bicyclists, toucan cross, cross, kind of a play on words. 
but you can see that it's intended to have a space and a path for bicyclists separate from pedestrians, reduce conflicts. Here was one of the uh, crossings uh, we saw that they actually have a narrowed down crossing, uh, well marked so motorists will know to yield to pedestrians. They have uh, good designs with the traffic calming, slower uh, and narrow uh, side streets. Some of the uh, streets in the downtown area that are really convert to uh, uh, almost pedestrian only streets for much of the day. And they're well used and businesses thrive in these areas, obviously. They have a lot of nice use of public space uh, you know, with all kinds of street vendors and activities. Uh, a very efficient bus system to supplement walking and bicycling. Some of the public spaces is in one of the boulevards, uh, very wide medians. And this particular road, when we took a bus tour, they have uh, playgrounds that they put right in, in the median of the road itself. So you have traffic moving on each side, but yet this public space is actually used for, for, for children to play with parent supervision. And the uh, guide signing is not just uh, geared toward motorists, but also gives pedestrians information on where they can go to get to different attractions and, and uh, even distances on those attractions sometimes. Uh, nice wide pedestrian street crossings with well-timed pedestrian signals, a nice efficient train system, that I used to ride to get into to meetings. Uh, the bicycle share program, where you can uh, you know, rent your bicycle for the day and for a fairly small amount of money. And the marketplace that attracts uh, many people in the downtown area. So, so Barcelona has a, a little of, of many of the different elements that, that uh, are very beneficial for pedestrian activity and safety. And Beijing, China, in many ways, is a fairly modern city. Uh, here's an uh, arterial street that carries lots of traffic, and I'm sure they did a lot of roadway and, and uh, pedestrian improvements before the Olympics a few years ago. Uh, here's a crossing in Beijing where they actually give pedestrians a choice. They can either uh, use this overpass to walk up the stairs uh, or go up the ramp and cross uh, one of the, the roadway legs, or they can push a button uh, you can see right in front of you that would uh, stop traffic on a red light and allow them to cross the street level. Here's some public space, a uh, pedestrian mall in downtown Beijing, uh, another example of some really nice uh, attractive space for pedestrians. Uh, looks like retractable bollards that can be used for pedestrians some time, part of the day and for, uh, allow motor vehicles for other times. And yet still the city does rely to some extent on bicycle use. Sydney, Australia. Uh, Australia is really well known for those of you in highway safety. Uh, for uh, different roadway measures to slow down vehicles, uh, nice public spaces, traffic calming, uh, photo enforcement, and uh, just a few examples of some of the, the measures there. There's a, a little pedestrian street in downtown Sydney, uh, a nice raised pedestrian crossing that helps uh, get speeds down at locations where pedestrians cross. And this crossing also has a narrowing too, a, a curb extension combined with a speed table uh, that's well marked, and so the speeds across this uh, crossing are uh, would be relatively low. The traffic calming in the, in the uh, some of the local residential streets, and even uh, you know good lighting to attract people to certain uh, areas down by the waterfront at night. Here's a pedestrian crossing in Dubai where they actually uh, uh, have a raised crossing here that's well marked. Uh, that has the yield sign for motors to yield to pedestrians, uh, and it's very, very narrow, so, so that's a, a well-designed pedestrian crossing. Going over to Cairo, uh, you have just a, a wide variety of streets and different users uh, on some of the streets. For those of you that have been there, I have not. I've not been to Egypt. hope to go someday. But uh, with their uh, underground system, their, their walkways, sidewalks, um, Mexico City, here's an example where they've actually narrowed down the effective width. They have a raised crossing that's well marked for this street crossing. Uh, a really nice uh, walkway here through a public park in Mexico City. Over in uh, Tanzania, Africa, uh, just a beautiful uh, area. I've never been to Africa, but another place I'd like to go. But uh, again, I've, I've gotten some photographs here and some of the same principles, the wide uh, median islands. We know from the U.S. that those can really reduce pedestrian crashes by 30 to 40 percent on multi-lane roads, um, and they've made you know use of, of that to uh, help pedestrians get across the street safely. Uh, I'm told that this is one of the most beautiful bus stops in the world. 
right there on the coast. So they make use of uh, public transit and the, the walkways along the uh, waterfront. In Bogota, Colombia, for those of you that have been there, that's well known for, for many, many uh, good designs, policies, practices for promoting uh, you know, safe walking, uh, good bus systems. You can see a nice uh, public area here. A uh, good bus system and still the, the bollards that protect pedestrians uh, from vehicles that may be out of control. Uh, you can see uh, speeds would be fairly low on the street and people walking to the bus stops. Uh, well designed uh, sidewalks that, uh, that, are, that are level uh, with narrow driveway openings. You can see the uh, overpasses across the arterial streets. Uh, the, the police and the enforcement on horseback. Going over to Indonesia with the different kinds of vehicles that they encounter there. And so how do you design a street system that safely accommodates all the different types of road users? And we did show a couple examples of this earlier. And here they do actually have, though, a, a separated sidewalk uh, with uh, railings to help protect pedestrians from other uh, motorized uh, users. Here's another example where they actually have the bus systems and how they try to channel pedestrians to get to the bus and to, to keep the bus lanes separate from the other motor vehicle lanes uh, and, and the different vehicle types that they, they need to design for and uh, uh, provide for. Another example where they, uh, they have different ways of getting the uh, bus passengers safely to the bus stops. Okay, going over to Japan now. And what we're going to show here is an example of some of the features um, for, that help pedestrians and motorists coexist. Here's a roadway where they actually limited it, narrowed it down to one lane of motor vehicle travel. And uh, they do have uh, uh, an area on each side for pedestrian travel in a fairly a commercial district. Wide pedestrian crossings uh, at this location, signalized crossing. You see a sort of a pedestrian bicycle a mall area, again, with a lot of commercial development. Uh, wide pedestrian crossings, uh, uh, again, in, in downtown Osaka. In India, again, we're talking about a little bit different uh, mix of, of users in some cases. Uh, bicyclists, motorists, uh, motorcyclists, uh, motor vehicles, pedestrians. And you can see that they have uh, a lot of different kinds of streets to accommodate than, than we would in the U.S. Uh, the marketplace here. and uh, trying to design and accommodate all the users uh, along with the bus uh, transit users. You can see the carts and the bicyclists and the pedestrians all need to interact and, and mix with the motor vehicles uh, and, the, uh, and the animals. Seoul, South Korea, uh, very you know, pedestrian-oriented streets. You can see many of them well-designed, very attractive, bring a lot of business of the downtown areas, um, again, having nice connections to buses and, and well-designed bus stops. This is a what we call a scramble uh, or Barnes Dance intersection crossing where traffic is stopped in all directions for a part of the signal cycle to allow pedestrians to cross uh, any direction as well as diagonally. And they use some of that. We use some of that here in the U.S. And they actually have separated out the crosswalk uh, markings for people going, uh, you know, away from where we're looking versus coming the other direction to actually to reduce the amount of conflict between pedestrians. Uh, here you can see where they've uh, created, again, a very narrow lane for motors to use and separate areas for uh, pedestrians, uh, separating the pedestrian and motorist uh, paths with bollards. And I've actually been, able, been seeing more of these raised bollards. Uh, certainly there are objects that can be struck uh, and cause injury to the motorist, but there are some situations where uh, we see these kinds of uh, raised barriers that uh, agencies have used to uh, separate motorists from pedestrian travel. Here's an example of a pedestrian mall in Brazil. Now just a, a few photos from Jerusalem since we were there and, and got to see a variety of conditions. And I guess uh, really the, the next few slides are going to be more in the old city, and, and these are uh, mostly pedestrian streets. Uh, we're connecting the uh, old city with some of the, uh, the new city streets with some, some of the pedestrian signals and crossings and uh, roundabouts. They have many good pedestrian areas, um, the sidewalk cafes, and areas like this. 
uh, here you can see where they, they didn't have, uh, they wanted to separate the pedestrian and motorist traffic, and they did use bollards on many of their streets like this. Uh, the marketplace in the, in the new city, which was really wonderful just to walk through and, and buy, buy things. Some of the side streets in Jerusalem were much like we, we've seen in some earlier slides that are built to be narrow with very low speeds and to help promote uh, safe uh, travel on foot. Uh, this was a crossing to one of the modern roundabouts, a uh, fairly good roundabout design uh, that we saw in many cases. One of the arterial streets near the old city here uh, is they have curb extensions. You can see the foliage uh, in the bushes and, and shrubs that were, were built uh, as curb extension into the street to really narrow down the effective street width. It also created kind of pockets of areas like these benches where this gentleman was sitting reading his Sunday paper uh, right there in the street environment. You know, we want to have nice, livable, walkable streets where people feel safe and want to, to uh, be able to enjoy the outdoors. Uh, now in New Zealand, we were in uh, Christ Church in Wellington uh, for about a week, and uh, they really did a good job, this is in Christ Church, of designing their sidewalks and walkways for pedestrian travel. Uh, this, here's another example of a scramble or barn stand signal where they give pedestrians uh, a part of the cycle, or every cycle, to cross any direction they want. Uh, now, it does increase pedestrian motorist delay to some extent, but we found in our research that it, it can reduce pedestrian crashes by about 50 percent, where it's, it's certainly appropriate. We have very heavy pedestrian crossing traffic uh, in a downtown area with moderate to low motor vehicle traffic, but this can be a solution in some situations. Uh, the trolleys that they had in Christchurch to uh, allow people to just leave their cars at home and walk or take a bike, take the trolley. Uh, in fact, you can see the stroller on the front of that <laughs> trolley where someone is, uh, has a child. And they even pay attention to some of the detail to make sure that their uh, crossings at railroad, well, railroad grade crossings with pedestrian paths have some of the amenities to uh, warn pedestrians to, to watch for trains. And they have these features where a pedestrian just has to stand on the tile. And uh, so there's a pre pressure sensitive mat that will alert uh, uh, the signal to stop traffic for pedestrians that are waiting to cross the street, whether they push the, the push button or not. And here's another crossing, I think this is Wellington, where they have a raised crossing that's well marked. Uh, um, it's elevated. Uh, you can see the uh, tactile warning uh, features. Uh, there are uh, signs. Uh, warning motorists of the pedestrian crossing. And this was, uh, I took this shot at the back of a, a uh, transit bus in Wellington. And it's just meant to remind pedestrians that uh, they need to be watching out for, for themselves, you know, stop, look, and live. That uh, it's, it's part of the educational program they have uh, to help reduce pedestrian injuries and deaths. Now we're over in Ireland, in the beautiful country of Ireland. And what we saw, there are many streets that were very narrow, the two-lane streets, uh, angle parking. These uh, the gentlemen with the stroller on the right felt comfortable just standing in, near the edge of the street and, and talking in fairly safe conditions. Uh, or they narrowed down the crossings with the, uh, we call the Belisha beacons that are flashing so that the speeds are low at the crossings. And if you're careful, you can even see a leprechaun crossing. And yeah, that, that is me on the left there. Uh, or the public parks that are really uh, well designed and you know, with nice pedestrian paths. Uh, here is a pedestrian mall in uh, downtown Dublin, just uh, flooded with pedestrians. Florence, Italy, with all the tourists they have. Uh, unfortunately, shortly after I took this shot, I was walking on the sidewalk and I heard a thud and turned around and a pedestrian had been hit right there in the road. So it was a very serious injury there. Uh, so uh, th those are one of the the things that have to be accounted for. And Florence does try to uh, accommodate large volumes of pedestrians on many of their areas, many of their streets, pedestrians from all over the world. See all the art and the architecture there. Munich, Germany, we found very nice pedestrian malls and facilities for bicyclists and pedestrians throughout the city. And what I tried to convey to the folks there in Jerusalem is that the United States, uh, no matter what you've heard, is, has really made many strides in many of our cities and areas around the U.S. in recent years. And even recently, I told them about our Secretary of Transportation uh, really citing the, reinforcing the importance for all engineers and planners to accommodate bicyclists and pedestrians in an equal footing as motorists. 
and he went on to say that for the past 50 years, we really have not done that as much as we should have to really reinforce that, that the importance of that. And then I started showing them some of the pedestrian treatments we have in the U.S., the pedestrian malls, this is in Boulder, and some of the road diets where they've reduced the number of lane, travel lanes from four lanes down to three lanes, in this case with a raised island. So not only do we reduce, reduce the crossing distance for pedestrians, so they only have to worry about crossing one lane of traffic at a time, but you also have the benefit of the raised island where pedestrians can wait in case a motorist doesn't stop and yield, they can wait for a gap and cross the second direction. Uh, we talk about how we retrofit some of our intersections to reduce crossing distance, to tighten up the turning radii, so motorists have to slow down when making the right turn. How this can increase the sight distance between oncoming motorists and pedestrians crossing the street. We talked about how raised median islands are being implemented in states like North Carolina, for example, and how we know that they can reduce uh, pedestrian crashes significantly on many of our multi-lane roads. About countdown signals that most of the European countries uh, or other countries don't use yet, but yet they use some of the research in the U.S. and San Francisco shows you can reduce pedestrian crashes by as much as 20 or 25 percent by converting the traditional uh, pedestrian signals to uh, countdown signals. In fact, they're experimenting with them, I think, in Germany now with countdowns. Uh, or pedestrian overpasses and underpasses, which are really considered a last resort because they're so expensive, but in some cases they, they're really the only uh, solution that, that you can use uh, uh, to help uh, pedestrians get across the street. Uh, I didn't go much into safe routes to school programs. I talked to them about more than the $600 million that we were uh, spending in the U.S. on safe routes to school programs and many uh, improvements that are uh, coming as a result of that. However, that's still only going to cover a small percentage of the schools we have in the U.S., so so, so much more is needed. <clears throat> and of all the cities I would select in the U.S. to kind of highlight, I didn't choose Seattle or Portland or Santa Barbara or Boulder or uh, some of the other cities that often come to mind as really being well-designed, well-planned cities for pedestrians. Uh, but I decided to use New York because so much good has gone in New York to provide for livability and pedestrian and bicycle traffic in the last few years that I see this as sort of a, a city that, that many of our U.S. cities can, can uh, model themselves. No, no other city, of course, is in New York in terms of population or uh, other aspects, but I think some of the uh, dramatic improvements they've made for pedestrian travel in the last few years is something we really need to take note of. Uh, this is uh, one of the areas that they've really converted many travel areas with tra uh, previously with travel lanes to areas for people to sit in uh, sidewalk cafes and for people to, to take over as pedestrians and bicyclists. The Brooklyn Bridge, which now you can cross by foot or on bike, we crossed over that a few times, a uh, fairly nice facility. Or in the Times Square area, uh, many of the uh, streets now are converted to walking streets. The Hudson River Greenway, it's a very nice facility. We rode for uh, several hours uh, along the Hudson River and some of uh, the back streets in, in New York, Manhattan, and how this really been converted to accommodate uh, people on, on foot, on bike, even on uh, rollerblades. Um, or Washington Square Park, which is really a, a wonderful area for pedestrians, and it was always crowded you know, during the daytime, people eating their lunch there or start taking a walk there or... Um, you know, even bands playing there in the evenings. Um, so anyway, I really tried to say that, that the U.S. Is, is making great strides in providing for pedestrians. San Jose, Costa Rica, uh, here's an example of a pedestrian mall. Uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, uh, very many good pedestrian areas, not only wide street crossings, but also areas for pedestrians, pedestrian malls and pedestrian spaces. Santiago, Chile. You can see here an example where they've really thought about the features of the trees for shading, the wide sidewalks, uh, the planters. You can see the bus stop on the left. They really tried to uh, correctly deal with many of the features to accommodate safe and uh, attractive pedestrian environment. Uh, Thailand, you can see uh, some of the features there. So anyway, uh, those are some of the main things. I did want to talk for just a, a few minutes about what we found in uh, uh, the part of this European study tour that we did in five countries as part of an FHWA AASHTO uh, effort to try to look at all that's being done for pedestrian and bicyclists safety and mobility, looking at policy, engineering, education, enforcement, looking at some of the safe routes to school programs, monitoring use levels, and safety research. And this shows that we went to uh, cities in Denmark, Sweden, Germany, Switzerland, and the, the UK 
and you can see the cities here, uh, usually a big city and a small town in each country. Just looking for some of the, the, the ways that they accommodate pedestrians and bicyclists. I'm going to focus more on the pedestrian side of things. Uh, in winter tour Switzerland, uh, basically what they did is they took a whole downtown area like this, and then they went through several stages. The upper left-hand corner was what it looked like in 1960. The green area was a pedestrian mall. In the upper right, they converted several streets in 1970 to pedestrians. The lower left, 1980, they added more streets. In the year 2000, you can see much of the downtown area is closed off to motorists most of the day. It's only for pedestrian travel. So you can see when we were there, it was really a, an open marketplace, very attractive, very nice just to walk along and uh, you could buy things and meet your neighbors and uh, whatever. Uh, another example from uh, Copenhagen, uh, this is what this street looked like in 1960. And they closed the street off uh, during one of the holidays, and it was so attractive and people liked it so much, they just kept it closed to motor vehicles and, and opened it up to pedestrians. And this is what it looked like uh, in two, year 2000. In Bern, Switzerland, in, in the 60s and 70s, they used to allow motor vehicles to park right there in front of the government building. And yet, uh, a few years later, in 2009, this is what it looks like. They really opened it up to public space. Uh, they uh, <clears throat> have markets and other public events in this uh, all year round. They have uh, a few other examples from Bern. Uh, the pedestrian over, uh, well, this is a bridge leading into the downtown area over a river. You can see the tram in the background. The pedestrian crossings are well designed, well planned, well maintained. You can see the, the good marking, the median island. Uh, this is a, a, what they call the uh, convex mirrors or the Trixie mirrors, uh, named after a girl, Trixie, who was hit on a bicyclist from a right-turning truck. And when they start putting these mirrors at intersections, then someone in a truck or even a car can look at these mirrors, and they can see everything going on to the right side of their vehicle and be less likely to strike a pedestrian or bicyclist when they're making a right turn. Very good uh, tram system public transit throughout uh, Bern and many areas of Switzerland, a well-designed uh, roundabouts, narrow streets with traffic calming at 30 kilometer per hour zone. Here's a, one of the few shared streets that we did see. Uh, they did say that you have to be very careful before you allow pedestrians and, and motorists and bicyclists to share the same road. You have to make sure you have all the right accommodations. Speeds have to be uh, very low for all users. And it requires you to be to see and be seen for everyone there. And it's only for special situations. Uh, here's another example of, a, of one of those streets. Uh, they use uh, automated enforcement fairly extensively throughout Switzerland and some of the other countries we visited. Here's one of the sidewalk cafes, uh, outside one of the restaurants, where a lot of the public space uh, is turned over to uh, uses like this. And in England now, over, over, over there, we uh, did see a lot more uh, devices, signs and markings and, and uh, barriers to try to channel pedestrians. And you can see uh, here's one of the pedestrian crossings with the wide, me wide median island, the Belisha beacon and the, and the high visibility marking. The zigzag on the approach means don't even think about uh, parking there. They don't want to block sight distance. Uh, the pedestrian push buttons, they wait and, and cross with care. Uh, this is actually called the subway, the uh, underpass uh, down that you can, go, you can cross below a street. Here's what it looks like down below. Uh, and many pedestrian crossings, well-marked narrow crossings, uh, narrow design side streets for low speeds and in pedestrian areas, uh, trying to accommodate uh, many of the large buses with pedestrian and bicycle travel. And basically the safety in numbers <coughs> issue we could talk a lot about, but essentially they do uh, uh, say that uh, having more pedestrians and bicyclists help increase driver's awareness. Of course, we also noticed that many of these countries had better education enforcement, better facilities. So, so you really need to have the facilities and, and the other elements as well, uh, as, as well as more volume. You want all of those uh, for the system to work um, efficiently. You want more pedestrians and bicyclists, and you want well-designed streets and enforcement and education. Essentially, uh, we saw some innovative treatments like the puffin signal crossings here so pedestrians don't have to push a button, that the detector senses them and changes traffic to a red light and to a uh, walk signal for pedestrians. Also, the near-side pedestrian signal heads is kind of experimental. 
uh, that they use in some of the countries. Uh, so pedestrians don't have to have their eyes fixed on the far side of the intersection. Uh, crossing islands were common. Uh, direct uh, connections to transit. Raised crosswalks we talked about. Uh, they have many areas of lower street design. <clears throat> they call them home zones or uh, 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 you know, streets for living, essentially, where the, they have cobblestone, narrow streets. Uh, they're well signed for low speeds, and uh, pedestrians uh, can use them uh, along with low-speed motorists. Widespread, widespread use of photo enforcement is something we saw throughout some of the European countries, much more so than we have in the U.S. And quite a bit more traffic safety education. It's not just something that's an afterthought that a few of the schools might do if they think about it, but uh, the upper right-hand corner is what they call a traffic garden. But they actually, uh, in winter tour of Switzerland, they actually train all their children to be safe pedestrians and bicyclists on kind of a miniature uh, street where they ride their bikes through it, they walk as pedestrians. It has real signals. Uh, it has uh, crosswalks, benches, trees. And so pedestrians and bicyclists get to use, uh, learn traffic safety uh, rules of the road safely by actually doing it, not just reading it from a book. And they have uh, very comprehensive programs where they involve parents in countries like England on child uh, pedestrian bike safety education. Uh, they have very um, uh, strong programs to encourage more people to walk and bike. And they set up goals for people, to, for manufacturers and for companies to meet those goals. Governmental agencies uh, have marketing campaigns to try to encourage more people to walk and bike and leave their cars at home. Uh, they have very good integration of pedestrians and bicyclists with public transportation, uh, public transport, rather, uh, buses and trains. They do a good job of trying to monitor their usage rates in cities and towns. And then they kind of showcase what those usage rates are by, on foot or by bike. And uh, one of the things that the, the uh, report shows, and we have this report on our website, Katie. Uh, you can probably give them the link. But essentially is many of these countries that we studied, <clears throat> it wasn't just a random array of policies and practices. Instead, uh, it was really a deliberate combination of things that they have, had put together to help balance pedestrian and bicycle needs along with motor vehicles. That includes you know, urban and land use policies. They have political support from the top levels. They have uh, increased costs for operating motor vehicles, like high gas prices. They have parking policies that are very uh, beneficial to, to pedestrian and, bi and bicycle use. They have a lot more enforcement. In some cases, uh, their street hierarchy is set up to uh, really give priority to, on some streets to pedestrians and, and uh, bicyclists. And they do try to do a better job of integrating bicycle and pedestrian needs on public transport. They have good connections, uh, so for walking and bicycling to get where you want to go without ha having to go on, on all the surface streets. They have um, you know, better education programs and pay a lot more attention to some of the street design detail uh, than, than some of our cities and states. Essentially, the next steps are to uh, really try to evaluate some of the innovative treatments that we found over there and, and still implement some of the sort of obvious or proven strategies in U.S. cities so we have more and better accommodations for pedestrians and bicycles, and to certainly try to identify certain local champions uh, to accommodate pedestrians and bicycles. Okay, Katie, that's um, all I'm going to cover today, and uh, so I'm, I'm open to any questions that uh, anyone may, may have at this time. Okay, great. And um, again, uh, thank you, Charlie. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Now we'll take some time for questions. Um, we have several questions here. I don't know if we'll be able to actually get to all of these, but um, please enter your questions into the box um, on the screen. Um, again, if we run out of time for all of the questions, uh, then we'll definitely be answering those questions and posting a Q&A document on the archived webinars page. Uh, so again, if we don't get to your specific question, we'll either get back to you um, personally with an answer uh, via email, or we might uh, we'll also do a Q&A document on our website um, and post it there. So here, um, first question is, um, how are others addressing bike lanes and right turn lanes or right through lanes with heavy right turn volumes? Okay, I assume you meant with, with heavy right turn motorist uh, volumes. Uh, 
Yes. Okay. And, I, I'm assuming that the way that that's worded, yes. Yes, okay. And um, what's interesting is every country we went to, now I'm going to focus my answer on those five countries that I talked about at the end, you know, Switzerland and Denmark and um, Sweden, Germany, uh, the UK. Um, and essentially every country has a little bit different uh, uh, recommendations in, in the signs and the markings that they use. There's not one standard uh, you know, set of uniform signs and markings. But I think if I would refer to the Copenhagen design, what they tend to do is at their downtown intersections, uh, you know, they have very high mode share of bicyclists in downtown Copenhagen. And if you remember back some of the shots I showed from Copenhagen, they use kind of a green uh, bike lane conflict area. In other words, right there where the, they extend the bike lane out essentially through the intersection to connect with the bike lane on the other side in, in green marking to really alert motorists that, that's, that they need to be aware when they make a turn across that, right turn across that green bike lane area. The other thing they do is they have separated uh, uh, bike signal phasing. In other words, all the traffic signals they have in downtown Copenhagen and um, uh, downtown Bern, Switzerland, they have separate uh, arrows you know, or uh, you know, signal phasing for bicyclists separate from motorists. So you may have a through bicycle movement uh, through an intersection while motorists are being held on a red light. And then they'll release the motorists to make the right turns while they hold bicyclists with a bicycle signal that says for bicyclists to stop. The third thing they do, I mentioned, is the, uh, the Trixie mirror, those convex mirrors, so that, that if there is a common phase where bicyclists can go through while, while trucks and cars can make a right turn, they have these big mirrors right there at the intersection, so all the driver has to do is glance at that, and they can see if a bicyclist is coming up from on their right side, uh, and, and by law they're required to yield to the through bicyclists when, before making the right turn. Because those are three measures that they use. Okay. Uh, I think our next question um, is actually coming from someone uh, uh, tuning in from India, uh, so to kind of uh, case the, the question. They're saying, um, in China, like in India, you take away people's livelihood if you put restrictions on bicycling use. Uh, so if you're, if you're putting restrictions on bicycling use. That, They're absolutely. commenting that I, they think something similar, uh, I think similar to taking away the car um, from people in the United States. Uh, they're, they're saying there's just no other way of getting to work. So how do you provide pedestrian safety while allowing non-traditional ways of bicycling use? So I think it's, you know, there's some of those photos earlier, uh, I think, reflecting people's, people's livelihood, kind of how they're, uh, they're getting goods and services around their community. So, you know, how do you balance that pedestrian safety with kind of the, not, you know, kind of the non-traditional ways of, of using bicyclists? Yeah, no, that's a really good question, and, and, and the, the purpose of showing the slides was not to say that we shouldn't use bicyclists for anything other than just one person riding, but what the, the point in some of the uh, photographs illustrate is there are some extreme uses, uh, whether it's a bicycle or motorcycle or on foot, uh, that, that can put that user at risk. So the, the point there is there are certain things that planners and engineers can do to try to build reasonably safe uh, facilities. Uh, but there is some responsibility on the part of you know, pedestrians, drivers, bicyclists, motorcyclists to you know, keep themselves safe. Uh, in other words, I'm not sure I would want to carry a you know, shell of a, of a car on my motorcycle or my bicycle. In other words, there, there are you know, certainly you know, people are going to do what they're going to do, um, but uh, the, the, the point there is we all try to you know, need to try to use some uh, judgment in anything we do. And that includes, you know, uh, pedestrians. When we cross streets, by law, motors may have to yield the, the right of way to us uh, in a marked crosswalk. But does that that doesn't mean we shouldn't at least look to see if somebody's going to going to be running through or running a red light in some cases. So we still all share some responsibility in keeping ourselves safe. And certainly, motors share much of uh, the responsibility uh, for crashes and injuries involving. Uh, vulnerable road users, but we all really need to, to balance safety as well as earning a living and getting across the street. 
Okay, great. Next question is about road diets. Um, have road diets reduced pedestrian collisions even if you don't reduce the walking distance across the street? The answer is yes. Uh, we, our organization here, Highway Safety Research Center at the University of North Carolina, finished a study a couple years ago where we really looked at um, about a dozen uh, corridors where they converted um, four-lane undivided roads to three-lane roads. And uh, these were uh, primarily roadway sections from Washington State, California, and uh, Iowa. And um, in all cases, the roadway w wasn't changed from you know, the right-of-way from the curb line to the curb line. All that was done was that when the road was resurfaced, they restriped it for three lanes. In some cases, they may have added a median island or um, added a bike lane. But, but essentially, the right-of-way line was the same. And overall, there was a 29% uh, reduction in total motor vehicle crashes on these roads after they had been converted from four lane down to three lane. Uh, here's a, a, a quick question. Um, where in the United States do we have pe the pedestrian scrambles? Okay, um, so that's a good question. They, these are not common in most cities. The cities that I have seen the most of them, uh, they have a den downtown Denver, Colorado, had probably 60 of them the last I checked. Uh, we saw a few in uh, San Francisco, a, f a few, very few, but a few in, in Seattle, I think, uh, uh, well, downtown Honolulu has a few. Uh, there are a few scattered around the Northeast, uh, up in New England. But uh, th th there are some issues. We have one in, in Chapel Hill. Uh, but essentially, they, they're, only, they're, they're mainly practical where you have uh, about more than about 1,000 you know, pedestrians per day, you know, combined with a fairly moderate to low motor vehicle flow. It can be made to work okay, but it can increase pedestrian and motor, uh, pedestrian motors delay. So you just have to be careful you know, when and where you use it. It's not that popular of a uh, signal timing scheme in the U.S. Uh, anymore. But we did see some of them, for example, in New Zealand and, and a few other countries. And um, I think somebody is asking, there's a few people that have, have commented since you've been answering that uh, New York City, and I apologize if you already mentioned these, but New York City, uh, San Diego, uh, uh, New Haven, uh, New Orleans, Boston. So these are just a couple of others that uh, some of our participants are kind of commenting on. And then another person, as you're at, at responding to that, asked, are we talking about the, the barn dance? Is that the, that's the same terminology as, as a ped scramble? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. And I, I knew about some of them in New England. But, but let me just mention that uh, there are other timing schemes that may also be even more appropriate at certain intersections. Uh, there's, I think, some evidence that the leading pedestrian interval uh, might certainly have some benefit to pedestrians where you release pedestrians to cross the street before you release motorists to give pedestrians kind of a head start to cross the street. Now, it doesn't have that fully protected interval like the, the barn stance or the scramble does. But um, that's another timing scheme that might be uh, you know, considered at certain signalized intersections. Great. Uh, another question. In, uh, it's kind of a long one. In most of the developing nations where the roads are serving many modes, um, uh, to reduce mid-block crossings in CBDs, overpasses and underpasses have been constructed. Um, both of them have proved to be a poor answer for the problem because people don't want to use them because of their general kind of unfriendly nature, this person's particular circumstances. So yeah. Do you have any suggestions in those kinds of circumstances where right of way is difficult to obtain for wide sidewalks? Right. Like overpasses and underpasses aren't an option. People don't want to use them, but they don't have the right of way for, for sidewalks. Are there other, um, other ways to get uh, to reduce mid-block crossings? Okay. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of different issues in that question. Uh, <laughs> let me, you know, we can, we, let me break it into little chunks. Okay. First of all, I mean, you're definitely right that there are many cases where an overpass or underpass, you can spend easily a million, two million dollars or more on a single overpass and nobody will use it. So it has to be just the right circumstance, just the right conditions. We have one in Chapel Hill that connects 
um, the parking deck, second level of parking deck with the hospital. And everybody, and a lot of people use it because it saves them, you know, the effort of walking down the steps, crossing a busy street, and walking back up, you know, a hill. So, so it's very popular and uh, it's effective. But most situations, uh, you know, don't lend themselves very well to an overpass or underpass, not only for the expense, but because, you know, they're, they're not convenient for people. And in those cases, you know, we have many other options that, that can be looked at. And those options, you know, some of them may be better in some situations than others. So I can't really just give a general answer that you should always do such and such. But I, but I would, the second part of the question, when you say you don't have room for sidewalks, you know, overpasses and underpasses don't work, so what should we do? I would say, well, you, you look at the situation and see if there are a, any, what are, are the other options that may be appropriate there. Uh, if you're talking about wanting to get pedestrians across the street, we know from our research in the U.S. that having uh, raised median islands on multi-lane roads uh, can reduce pedestrian crashes by you know, 30 to 40 percent. Um, we have some new devices in the 2009 Manual and Uniform Traffic Control Devices, things like the uh, Hawk Signal and things like the Rectangular Rapid Flash Beacon that have uh, both shown to be very effective. The Hawk Signal ha uh, was found to reduce pedestrian crossing crashes by about 60 percent, uh, and, and I don't have time to go into the, all the detail what that is, but it's kind of a modified traffic signal with some pedestrian features and some different timing schemes. And there are some, guide, some uh, warrants uh, where you can install this uh, Hawk Signal that are easier to meet than installing a traditional traffic signal. So go check your 2009 MUTCD, and that'll give you some of the details there. This rectangular rapid flash beacon, it's uh, uh, meant to uh, provide pedestrian crossings where a traffic signal is not warranted, uh, and it's really an irregular flash on a uh, approach on a sign at the crossing, and it's been found to dramatically increase the percentage of motorists that yield to pedestrians crossing wide streets from less than about 5 or 10 percent up to about 90 percent or more. Uh, but, but again, you have to have the right conditions for that to be uh, a viable option. So there are many different treatments, uh, geometric and otherwise, that can be considered uh, for getting pedestrians across the street. The other thing is if you don't have a sidewalk or walkway for pedestrians, then you've got problems. Because how, how are pedestrians going to get there in the first place? You know, either they're not going to walk at all or they're going to be walking in the street. So, so somebody, you know, if, I, I don't know all the details of your situation, but it, it really needs to be looked at in terms of you know, getting pedestrians along the street as well as how to get them safely across the street. Great. Um, another question I might be able to answer with just some of the, uh, the resources that we have, like maybe, maybe PedSafe and the How To Guide, but um, where can we find more details and, and specifics of good design and best practices? And they go on to list a few. Um, really kind of needing more details to help with implementation. Okay, no, good question. Okay, let me, let me just run through, and, and all these resources I'm going to mention are on our walkinginfo.org website. Um, first of all, I mean, there's the AASHTO Pedestrian Guide. And if you haven't gotten a copy of that, get that. Um, and it actually is going to be updated here in, in another year or two. But that's, that's really something you need to be looking at. We have some documents on, on our, we don't have that one on our website because you have to pay for that one, but uh, we have documents like the uh, PedSafe Guide uh, that has more than uh, about 47 different pedestrian-related treatments that are available to be used uh, to help pedestrians get across the street. Uh, and then we have about 71 success stories or case studies of of folks that have implemented one or more of these treatments. Uh, there's another resource on the website that's fairly recent. Uh, it contains about another, an additional 100 case studies or success stories uh, that, that involve documenting you know, pedestrian treatments and some you know, many bike treatments that have been implemented around the U.S. You know, and each one has a section on what was the problem to, to begin with, what was the solution that was chosen and why, and what was the outcome of that solution? And then each of them has a, the name of the local contact person with their phone number and email address, so you can contact that person to get more information. So uh, there's another document called How to Develop a Pedestrian Safety Action Plan. Uh, it's a feature document on our website, and uh, we actually teach a series of training courses for Federal Highway Administration's uh, Office of Safety uh, on that, that guide, uh, as well as another training course called uh, Designing for Pedestrian Safety. It's like each of those is a two-day workshop that goes into uh, many of the strategies uh, 
for pedestrian safety and mobility. Uh, if anybody is interested in finding out more about any of those training courses, you know, uh, send uh, an email to Katie or me, and, and we'll certainly follow up with you. We can talk by phone and let you know more about those training opportunities. Uh, we've had, um, and Charlie, you just let me know when uh, when you want me to stop uh, asking questions. <laughs> well, um, we can keep going uh, as long as people want. Okay, for maybe about uh, maybe the next maybe about another ten minutes. Yeah, ten okay. fifteen minutes, sure. Okay. Um, we've had two kind of, one question and one kind of comment about the need uh, for becoming a champion. Um, there were two. Uh, two separate comments. Before, uh, the, the question was really kind of how does one become a champion of these great ideas? Um, I want to I have you answer that. I also want to mention that we had a similar webinar that we did. Uh, Pete Lagerway uh, has come to Power of 25, and it's really all about that and how you kind of create um, a, a groundswell of support for this issue um, and, and different places to go. That webinar is archived on the page that I mentioned um, that's listed actually on the, the site right now, walkinginfo.org forward slash webinars. Uh, so we have a whole presentation on that issue, but I want to also kick that to Charlie to kind of talk about. Okay, let me give you a short answer, and then I'd love for that person or persons to, to call, and we can chat about that. Um, a champion can either be a citizen or advocate, or it can they can be an engineer, planner, educator, police officer, it can be in almost any area uh, within a community or city that cares about pedestrian safety and providing for safer and better walking and bicycling. Uh, an example, when we were doing a study for National Highway Traffic Safety Administration in uh, Miami-Dade County, uh, the study there was to try to uh, identify, you know, where the crash problems were and uh, then try to work with all the different stakeholders and champions to uh, address the problem. There were two champions in particular that stood out. David Henderson, who is the uh, 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 Miami-Dade pedestrian bike coordinator, and he really was a champion. I mean, he really helped direct many of the different activities that were going on uh, with the uh, with the neighborhoods, with the surrounding communities, uh, the educational materials, working with the police. But there were also other champions. Uh, Julian Hotz, uh, that was a, a trauma doctor at the Ryder Trauma Center. She uh, got a little bit of funding and went out and did pedestrian safety education in most of the 200 elementary schools in the county. Uh, there were other champions throughout the county. There were other engineers and planners that really cared about a certain part of that problem and, uh, and just, uh, you know, went about uh, doing what they could uh, in terms of there was one uh, gentleman from the University of Miami, and uh, he worked with uh, Little Haiti, the Haitian community, to really try to reduce crashes in that group. Uh, there's, there was uh, uh, one of the police officers that helped uh, organize and, and get involved with some of the enforcement that went on in, in uh, South Beach. So if you want to, I mean, there's so much that needs to be done in every city. Please feel free to call me if you want to, 919-962-7801. I'd be glad to chat with you more about it. Uh, or we could even put you in touch with other uh, folks in your city or community, perhaps, and you can work uh, closely with them in figuring out what needs to be done and how to go about it. Okay, Katie, any more questions? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, what are the recommended sidewalk widths for residential, commercial, and downtown areas? Okay, that, that's a good question. Um, there are no, okay, the only national guideline, there's something in ADA uh, that was really, that came out um, with some of the regulations a few years ago that set a minimum of three feet, but uh, we all know, I'm sorry, of uh, four feet, but we all know that that's not wide enough. Uh, it depends on the area, really, that uh, that you're talking about. Uh, basically, it depends. If you're in a downtown area, you may need a, a much, much wider sidewalk than if you're in a, on a neighborhood street. So it just depends. Uh, some local agencies have their own guidelines for, you know, the width of streets on different types of roadways. But there, there's no hard and fast national guideline on how wide sidewalks need to be on different kinds of roads and streets. So it, it, it largely has to do with uh, volume. I mean, some, some cities have, uh, you know, huge numbers of pedestrians, you know, a, a Washington, D.C. or New York City or uh, Seattle, Washington. So they have to really, you really need to be sensitive to your pedestrian volumes and how to accommodate them safely. 
And uh, we'll take two more questions. Uh, first one is, what types of pedestrian strategies or solutions did you encounter in more rural areas and or suburban areas? Okay, uh, good question. <clears throat> um, essentially, when you get into suburban and rural areas, uh, you, some of your choices of pedestrian provisions may be different than in a downtown area, obviously. Instead of having, for example, if you're in a very rural area, it may not be feasible to build a, a concrete sidewalk. Uh, however, uh, it may be important to have, well, it is important to have some facility for pedestrians to walk because, you know, pedestrians do walk in, in uh, rural areas and certainly in suburban areas. The car may break down or they just don't, you know, they may need to get somewhere on foot. Not everybody owns a car or has a driver's license. About a third of our population are not car drivers or vehicle drivers. So we need to accommodate pedestrians on, on essentially all types of roads and streets. So in a rural area, having a, a nice paved shoulder might be an alternative to having a sidewalk. Uh, at street crossings, I think it depends on where you're talking about, certainly in suburban areas where you may have multi-lane streets. You do need to accommodate uh, pedestrian crossings, some of these arterial streets with raised median islands uh, that are uh, designed with, uh, you know, pedestrian, traffic and pedestrian signals that provide adequate time for pedestrians to get across. There are many different features of signals and design strategies like the uh, size of your turning radi radius that needs to, to balance pedestrian needs because if your turning radius is too wide, pedestrians have to cross very long distances, which may not be uh, appropriate. So, so there are just different design features and traffic control features that can be applied in suburban and rural areas uh, that uh, need to be addressed and to, to not just think about urban areas when you think about pedestrians. Great. And, uh, and our last question, uh, this one coming from, uh, from Canada, a particular issue that they're having in, in their community. Are there any good examples of changes to, uh, changes to curb radii to reduce the speed of cars turning right, uh, essentially to reduce chances of hitting and killing pedestrians? Yes. Um, essentially, we, we cover this in some detail in our training course. And I'm not going to give you an exact turning radius because you do have to at least consider the types of vehicles, you know, and right turning vehicles in particular that you do have at an intersection. But what we have found from some cities is that they're able to use turning radii much tighter than they may have thought. Uh, they may assume that you have to accommodate fully uh, the largest truck to make a right turn and still end up in the right hand lane. And that's just not necessarily the case that some cities uh, you know, allow trucks, for example, making a right turn to encroach into the second lane, uh, and it is rarely, if ever, a, a safety concern. But we, we need to think about, you know, the different users of the intersection, not just the motor vehicle users, but also if you have pedestrians and bicyclists that need to cross there, if your turning radius is too wide, then pedestrians have to cross almost double the distance that they would have to cross in a crosswalk compared to having a, a much tighter turning radius. So it's sort of balancing Yes, accommodating all the, the vehicles that, that need to, to turn right safely, but still realizing that we need to, uh, uh, in many cases, tighten up the turning radius to accommodate uh, safer pedestrian travel. Plus, having a tur tighter turning radii better allows you to meet the accessibility guidelines that have been set up uh, to be able to have one curb can uh, cut uh, on each direction. In other words, so you can have two curb ramps per corner. Uh, which is also a much preferred design for people in wheelchairs uh, than would be just a, a diagonal curb cut. Okay. I think that's about all the time we have for, for questions. Um, as I mentioned, if we did not get to your question today, uh, we will be uh, addressing all the, the submitted questions and then um, some of them we'll actually post them on the webinar page, some of them we might get back to you um, just directly if it's just kind of a um, a more direct question, but again, we will be addressing all the questions submitted. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, a recording and a transcript of today's program, as well as a PDF copy of the slide presentation, will be available at the web address shown, www.walkinginfo.org forward slash webinars. Um, we try to get that up within about a week following the webinar. Um, the, 
the presentation slide and recording may be up before the transcript, but um, we'll try to get all of that up within about a week. Um, I also want to mention that we do have all of our webinar series archived and posted there as well. Uh, this is the sixth in our series now, and so you can go on. Uh, we've got a variety of different topics there, so I'd encourage you to, uh, to access those archives. Finally, I want to remind everyone that there will be a very brief survey, and it will appear once the webinar is ended as you close out. Um, again, we'd very, very much appreciate you taking a moment to complete it. It's just about uh, four questions. And thank you again to our speaker, Charlie Zagier. Well, thank and, you all uh, very much for attending. Yes, and, uh, and yep, and thank you for attending today's PBIC Livable Communities webinar, and uh, have a great week. And thanks to Katie also. Thanks, Charlie. <laughs>